in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. I'd like to give you a small analogy that will help you understand this issue. Why, why are hearts sealed or why is that mentioned in the Quran? Uh, some of you or many of you are familiar with exercise working out, right? So imagine somebody got into an accident and they're, they're, they're uh, in the hospital. And they're in a hospital bed for six months. And they haven't moved their legs for six months to a year. When they get up, are they able to use their legs? No, probably they're, you know, they tip over. Like that, the, if, if our muscles, if they're not worked, if they're not exercised, they start losing their ability to function. Like if you keep your eyes closed for five years, you're probably going to open them blind. You understand? The ability to accept guidance, the ability to reason in, a, in, a, in, an un, in a fair way, in an unbiased way, is a God-given muscle that we have, a spiritual muscle that we have, an intellectual muscle that we have. And people at the time of the Prophet ﷺ were invited to exercise that muscle. And they refused to. They refused to exercise the ability to take in and seriously consider truth when it came to them. And the, you continue to deny that capability you have inside you, the exercise. You refuse to think, you refuse to think, you refuse to use your heart, you refuse to be sincere. And guess what? Eventually your heart is no longer capable of what it was originally capable of. You lost that muscle, you lost that ability. And that is an analog analogous way of explaining what does it mean when a heart is sealed. It is not something that a, a person has a belief system and therefore their heart is sealed. That isn't the case. An atheist could be atheist for philosophical reasons or for psychological reasons. And we, we don't know what's going on inside somebody's heart. We don't. As a matter of fact, on this issue, whose heart is sealed and whose is not sealed, my favorite example in the Quran is that of the worst character probably mentioned in the Quran, who even shaitan would probably want an autograph, Fir'aun. Fir'aun, okay? I mean, declares himself God, the Pharaoh. For those of you who aren't familiar with that, the Pharaoh. Declares himself God. Commit, committer of like massive genocide, all kinds of you know hedonism, ego pride, you name it. You name the vice, he's got it. You name the vice, he's got it. And yet, when Moses is sent to him, alayhi salam, to speak to him, he's supposed to not judge what's in his heart, and he's told, "Is there anything left in you? You might want to cleanse yourself. Maybe you want to become a good person now. Maybe even you can change, killer of babies. Even you can change. I mean." You would think, if you think of heartless, you think of a murderer, and the murderer of children? I mean, it's beyond imagination. And yet his heart is not condemned yet. Even he's given the opportunity. So the idea of hearts being sealed, the final bit on this answer, the idea of people's hearts being sealed is not something you and I have privy to. We do not have access to know whose heart is sealed and whose isn't. And thank God for that. We don't. And using that, that term and that label, you know, carelessly is actually blasphemous in my opinion. Allah speaks from the position of master and He can say about a person's heart what He can. I can't say that because I'm not God. He is. He can talk like that. Just because He speaks with authority doesn't give me the, the same authority. It actually helps me recognize his, his authority even more. So when He is angry with a group of people, that doesn't translate into you should be angry at them. You have to understand this point. And I know this is, I, I, you should move on, but this point needs to be understood. For instance, and please, if there are Christians in the audience, with all due respect, God is actually extremely angry at the idea that a son be attributed to him in Islamic faith. This is something that offends him in, re in our revelation. And in Surah Maryam, it comes to its climax. The skies and the earth are about to tear open when it's said that the most merciful, the loving, has taken a son. So he's extremely angry, bottom line, in the Quran, at who apparently? Christians, right? And yet the Christians, who according to him are saying this, and it's a big deal to him that he shouldn't, this shouldn't be said, they come to visit the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They come to visit the Prophet Muhammad in the city of Medina. And they're there to discuss faith with him. Because they've heard he's made claims to prophethood. So where do they stay? Where do they stay? Anybody know? The, the mosque of the Prophet. And where do they pray to Christ? Where are they told by divine decree to pray? At the mosque. They perform Christian prayers inside the mosque. And yet we have revelation already. Makki Surah, Surah Maryam. We already have revelation that this angers God. But Allah has the, he has the right to be angry at what He has a right to be angry with. His anger does not translate into my anger. We're still supposed to be the best we possibly can be. They're still our brothers and sisters in humanity. A lot of times Muslims don't know where to draw the line. They take Allah's authority from the Quran and make it their authority. Where do you, what do you think you're doing? 
You're, he speaks from his position of authority. We have to read the Qur'an as slaves, not as masters, not as judges of others. So this, this point needs to be very, very clearly understood. And even the way in which the discourse was done by the Prophet, like the, 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 the height of courtesy and respect, the height of it, you know? And so this, this distinction, especially for Muslims, if somebody says, why should we even talk to atheists? Why should we even talk to anybody? First of all, I know what you mean by talking. You want to go and debate with them. Don't debate with people, I told you already. Stop that. Go, go get some pizza with them. <laughs> Do that, okay? Go, go, you know, just play some basketball or whatever. And you have a friend who doesn't believe in God, fine. He's not evil. He's not evil. He doesn't have two invisible horns on the side and a tail in the back and a pitchfork or whatever. It's just because he's an atheist, he's a human being. He's a dignified human being. Every human being has dignity. You don't know how they can turn around. You just don't know. You know? And you're not just constantly there to preach to people. You have to be a decent human being to people first.